Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all today to our event this evening, The Evolution of MATLAB. We are honored to welcome Professor Cleve Moeller today to the Technical University of Munich as our eminent guest speaker. Professor Moeller is the inventor of MATLAB and chairman, co-founder, and chief scientist at MathWorks, one of the leading developers for technical computing software. He is also one of the authors of LINPAC and Fortran libraries, or IcePack libraries for Fortran. Before starting at MathWorks, Professor Moeller worked as a professor of mathematics and computer science at the University of Michigan, Stanford University, and the University of Mexico for almost 20 years. He also worked for Intel Hypercube, the Ardent Computer Corporation, and Professor Moeller holds a bachelor's degree from California Institute of Technology and a PhD from Stanford, both in mathematics. He has also been awarded honorary degrees from the Linköping University, the University of Waterloo, and the Technical University of Denmark. Professor Moeller received the IEEE Computer Pioneer Award for improving the quality and accessibility of mathematics software through the creation of MATLAB. He was also awarded the IEEE John von Neumann Award for fundamental and widely used contributions to numerical linear algebra and scientific engineering software that transform computational science. We are honored to have you here with us today, Professor Muller, and we look forward to learning more about the creation and evolution of MATLAB. Following uh, Professor Muller's speech on the evolution of MATLAB, he will join with our honored academic speakers, Professor Manfred Breu, Professor Klaus Diepold, uh, Professor Florian Holzapfel of the TU Munich for a panel discussion on the topic, computational thinking as a driver of convergence between computer science, engineering, and math, which will be moderated by Joachim Schlosser. Thank you very much, Professor Breu, Professor Diepold, and Professor Holz Holzapfel, and Mr. Schlosser for being here with us today. Professor Moller, on behalf of the TUM Business Club, I want to express our thanks and gratitude for taking your time to share your knowledge with us here today. We look forward to learning from you. And now, please everyone give a warm welcome to Professor Muller. Danke wie Mars. You speak English very well. Uh, I was looking at the uh, previous speakers in this series, and I hope I fare better than the last speaker. Uh, I don't know if you realize it, but the speaker in July was the uh, chairman of Volkswagen. <laughs> I, I don't think I can get deposed by the board of directors, though. I, So I want to uh, talk about the, uh, let's see, how do I, oh, that just shows up on the center screen, okay. Um, I want to talk about the evolution of MATLAB. Uh, I want to start way back long before the beginning of MathWorks and go back to uh, three people that had a huge influence on my life. John Todd, George Forsyth, and J.H. Wilkinson. Uh, at the end of the Second World War, institutes, and universities, and government labs all over the world were uh, striving to build electronic computers. In England, um, uh, uh, Alan Turing at the National Physical Laboratory proposed building a complicated machine called the Automatic Computing Engine, the ACE. Uh, it was based on work that he'd done during the Second World War, but the, that work was secret and the management of, of NPL didn't know about it. So they uh, were reluctant to build the machine. Turing got upset and left NPL and went to the University of Manchester. It fell to his assistants to build a simplified version of the machine that was called the Pilot Ace. And one of those assistants was a young mathematician called Jim Wilkinson. 
Wilkinson is shown here at the console of the Pilot Ace in 1951. Wilkinson went on to become one of the, the, the world's leading authority on matrix computation and was a mentor and a friend of mine. And I'll be telling you a lot more about Wilkinson as we go on. At the meantime, in Southern California at UCLA, the American National Bureau of Standards was sponsoring the a machine called the Standards Western Automatic Computer, the SWAC. They um, collected a group of mathematicians to form the Institute for Numer Numerical Analysis. Uh, here is George Forsyth, the tall gentleman in the center of picture. Olga Towski Todd is the only woman in the picture. And John Todd is peering over their shoulder the Institute of Numerical Analysis was dissolved in 1954 in a uh, political uh, scandal involving battery additives. That's an interesting uh, story that I'll tell you about over beer sometime. Uh, Forsyth went up north to Stanford and the Todds went across Los Angeles to Caltech. Here's the faculty of mathematics at Caltech in the late 1950s. Olga was the only, uh, was the first full professor at Caltech. And uh, there's uh, John Todd looking over his shoulder again. Here's a clipping out of the Deseret News in Salt Lake City in 1951, they wrote uh, columns about precocious high school students. This says I'm going away to Caltech and there's electrons swirling around my head. I think I got admitted to Caltech because I was from Utah and that was their idea of diversity back then. <laughs> I studied numerical analysis under John Todd at Caltech. One of the first times a course with that name was offered any place. We did some of our computations on this machine. This was the Burroughs 205 Datatron, one of, the f one of only about a dozen computers in Southern California at the time. This was a vacuum tube machine. Those are vacuum tubes in the cabinets back there. This was a personal computer. Only one person could use it at a time. You signed up for time at 2 o'clock in the morning and went over and got half an hour. We wrote our programs in absolute numeric machine language. We didn't have an assembler or a compiler. I did a project on Hilbert matrices under Todd's direction. That was my first encounter with matrix computation. When it came time to go to graduate school, Todd recommended I go to Stanford and worked with his friend uh, George Forsyth. I did that, became a graduate student in mathematics at Stanford. Uh, Forsyth was a math professor, but then he went on to found the uh, computer science department at Stanford, now one of the world's famous computer science departments. I was a graduate student in mathematics at the beginning, but when then I left, I was an instructor in the new computer science department. We did our computing on this, uh, this machine. Uh, there's this tape drives for the IBM 7090 in the background, uh, but in the front is the DEC PDP-1. Uh, here's a, this had a cathode, cathode tube display, and here's the console of the PDP-1. It had sense switches on the console that you could move up and down and read from the computer. A guy named Steve Russell at MIT programmed this, the world's first video game, Space War. You could use the sense switches to control the uh, rockets, move them into position, and uh, fire missiles at the other uh, rocket. You were in a gravitational field in the, of the sun at the center. Uh, this was so popular, they put a sign up on the machine that said, no space war between 8 a.m. and 10 p.m. And then somebody scribbled, the world needs a sign like this. We tried to have a, a, a space war contest with MIT from Stanford. 
but the data rates over the phone lines were too slow to, to do it. Uh, let's see. Um, in 1964, as a graduate student, I went to this conference in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, uh, that uh, 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 Householder organized. This was the uh, Conference on Linear Algebra. This is the organizing committee. All six of these men had something important to contribute to MATLAB. Uh, Wilkinson, Givens, Forsyth, and Householder uh, they're all, tra all methods based, that, based on mathematics, these men uh, uh, in, in MATLAB. Uh, Henrizzi had an important influence on my life with other kinds of mathematics. And then on the far right is Fritz Bauer. So we're in Bauer's uh, lecture hall here. Uh, he was one of the, of course, the important authors of, the important author of Algol and uh, the MATLAB language and, and uh, uh, is, ba is based on Algol. I'll have something more to say about, uh, about Bauer in a moment. But those were this, the, this was the organizing committee of the uh, Gatlinburg meeting in 1964. There's a 60, that has gone on to be a series of meetings uh, every four years that are now called the householder meetings that have been an important uh, part of my professional life. Uh, as you know, Bauer passed away a few months ago and all, all six of these men are now gone. But all of them made important contributions to MATLAB, including Bauer. This is a page out of my thesis, PhD thesis about eigenvalues of um, the Laplacian on, on uh, finite differences. Uh, there's the, um, my example was the L-shaped membrane that became the MATLAB MathWorks logo. Here's how the MathWorks logo has evolved over the years. We're the only company in the world that has the solution to a partial differential equation as the company logo. And it evolved from the uh, two-dimensional contour plot that I could draw uh, back in, in my thesis, and then we got to a black and white wireframe, and then in three dimensions and increasingly sophisticated color models until we have the logo that we have today. Uh, Forsyth taught a course, uh, a numerical analysis course, and wrote some notes about matrix computation. I taught the course, and then we uh, those course became this book. It was cited by the ACM as an important textbook uh, in computing because it had actual code. There are programs in this book in Algol, Fortran, and PL1 for solving systems of simultaneous linear equations. Wilkinson visited the United States every summer. Uh, Visited, taught at a short course at the University of Michigan, uh, and then went, Ar went to uh, Argonne Laboratory, visited Argonne, uh, where we were working. I'll, t I'll tell you about that in a minute. But here was, uh, here's Wilkinson uh, at the seminar w room in, uh, in Argonne. Um, Wilkinson was working on, on uh, Wilkinson and a number of other people were working on methods for matrix eigenvalue computations and publishing their um, results in Algol. Uh, in, and that got collected in this book by Wilkinson and Reinch. And uh, the important uh, contributions here are by Bauer as the instigator of this series and then by Christian Reinch uh, from here in Munich. Is, is Christian here? He's here. There. Oh, here he is. So, so I, 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 I would have loved to have been in on the interactions between Wilkinson and Reinch as they worked over the details of these codes in this book. These codes, these, these Algol programs today are still a wonderful way to 
read about how we do these methods. I go back to these things as a source today and read the code. It sure is a whole lot better to read this code than to try and read the C or the Fortran that we uh, generated later. So thank you, Christian, for your contribution uh, to this book. It's still uh, uh, an import, a very important volume in our, in our uh, literature. Uh, but it was an algol, and so nobody could use it or hardly anybody could use it. You could use it here, and they could use it in Amsterdam, but there were a few places that had actual algol compilers. So we needed to translate it to Fortran, uh, so it would become more widely used. And that became the ice pack project, to take these algol programs and turn them into Fortran. And that was done at Argonne, by the first six, by the, these people in and, and this project, and then I was a hanger-on. I would visit Argonne in the summer, and that became the Ice Pack project, Ice Pack for Eigen System Package. Um, that was followed by the LinPack project. That wasn't a translation project. This was new code. Uh, this is a matrix on the front. If you get bored here, you can compute the inverse of this matrix and check with me afterwards. The, inver the, the inverse is on the back of the manual. Um, here's, the four, here's the four authors of the LINPAC guide in 1979. Uh, Jack Dungara, who's gone on to be a famous uh, uh, spokesman for high performance computing. I imagine, I don't know, Dungara has probably maybe given a lecture in this room or visited this place. Uh, me, Pete Stewart, and, and Jim Bunch. There's uh, Dungara's car with a LINPAC license plate. Uh, here's a photograph 33 years later. Uh, Dun uh, Dungara's lost the most hair, but I have the neatest shirt. Here's the big, LINPAC is known as a, as a benchmark. Um, it, was a, it was a Fortran library, but it's now known as a LINPAC, as a LINPAC, as a, LINPAC, as a benchmark. It's the basis today for deciding what's the fastest computer in the world. And here's the beginning of that. We, we sent out our programs to 20 institutions, um, I guess these are all in the US, universities and laboratories, and ask them to run them on their machines at the time, and actually just to time one. These were the times uh, in 1977, 1978, to solve a 100 by 100 linear system. 100 by 100 linear system would just fit into the machines at the time. I can't even time the 100 by 100 system on my laptop today because it's too fast. It goes in a fraction of a clock tick. But uh, it would, on the supercomputers of the time, it, would, it was a substantial computation. In fact, at the machine at Yale, which is at the bottom of this chart, it didn't even fit into memory on their central machine. We had to do a 75 by 75 and extrapolate. The fastest machine in the world is the top of the machine, and the newly installed Cray-1 at the National Center for At Atmospheric Research. And it, uh, oh, the numbers that are written in by hand there are Dungara's cop calculation of megaflops, millions of, flo millions of floating point operations per second. And the fastest machine in the world at the time was 14 megaflops. That was the, N the Cray-1 at NCAR. So the, today's, machine, today's machine are nine orders of magnitude faster than that. That's incredible uh, uh, speed up over that, over that period of, of uh, well, 40 years. So that's the beginning of the LINPAC benchmark. It's, it's, the LINPAC benchmark is still solving a system of linear equations. It's bigger than 100 by 100. It's a whole lot bigger but it's still solving a dense system of linear equations. Oh yeah, that's become the top 500. Now it's got pretty boring because the top 500 is still headed by this machine in China. 
and who seems to what seems to have been built just for the purpose of winning this top 500 contest. Um, okay, in, here's a here's a long story. In 19 um, uh, in 1976, I made a film at Los Alamos about the singular value decomposition. How many people here know what the singular value decomposition is? Oh, a uh, fair number. It's a very important matrix calculation that's now the basis for many algorithms we have in statistics and control theory and so on. In 1979, it was, it was new. It had been known theoretically, but longer, but we just, for the algorithm for computing it was, was just a few years old. I made a film at Los Alamos that did two things. It showed off the computer graphics we had at Los Alamos, and it showed off um, the methods for computing um, the singular value decomposition. Um, the producers of this Star Trek movie, the first Star Trek movie, went to Los Alamos and wanted video to run, in the con run on the console of the uh, Enterprise. And so um, I want to show you a clip out of the first Star Trek movie uh, called Star Trek The Motion Picture. So if we can dim the house lights, I'm going to show you this uh, this bit of the movie. I hope it gets dark enough that you can see this here. Look on the scope behind Spock. That's the sing, can you see that? That's the singular value decomposition being computed. A maximum phaser strike directly at the beam might weaken it just enough for us to break free. Break free to work, Commander. Here Any show of resistance would be futile, Captain. We don't know that, Mr. Spock. Why are you opposed to trying? inside not to destroy us they could have done that outside they still can curiosity mr decker insatiable curiosity okay so that's how the singular value decomposition saved the universe Here's the still out of that and zooming in. When you capture it, that's as fuzz that gets that fuzzy. But here's here's what it is, the simulation of what it is. So the we're computing transformations which introduce zeros into the matrix and eventually reduce it to a diagonal form that contain the singular values on the diagonal. What was interesting at the time was uh, the graphics was done not with the Z-buffer algorithm, which we have today, 
but with when we have enough memory to hold the whole graphic, the whole picture in, in memory, but actually was simulating um, a pen on paper computing all the intersections of all these triangles that like, like used to be done on the old uh, uh, drum and drum drum, uh, drum prodders. So that was being done in the graphic software. And uh, the uh, people at Los Alamos had just done the hidden line algorithm. So we were actually testing the Los Alamos uh, graphic software as well as demonstrating the singular value decomposition in the film we made at, uh, in 1976. That was before MATLAB. We didn't have MATLAB yet. That was going to become MATLAB. We didn't have MATLAB graphics. That would eventually become MATLAB graphics. Because I was just starting to write MATLAB. I was teaching numerical analysis and uh, uh, linear algebra at the University of New Mexico. I wanted my, have my students to have access to LINPAC and ICEPAC without writing Fortran programs. So I read this book uh, by Klaus Wirth. Uh, Wirth had been at Stanford. He was then in, went to Switzerland. Uh, uh, this, the, he, had, he had a baby version of Algol called PL0. This book talked about how to parse PL0. I learned how to parse programming languages from this book. So I wrote the first version of MATLAB in Fortran, uh, making um, MATLAB as a, a version of PL0 with matrix as the only data type. Uh, here's some statements out of that first, uh, first MATLAB. It was just a matrix calculator. There were no M files. No functions. This is, this is all the functions there were. Uh, there's only 80 functions. If you said help, this is what you got. There's no ordinary differential equations, no FFT. That's all, just a few matrix calculations, a few matrix computations. Here's an example of the kind of thing you could do. Uh, here was the graphics you had. This was portable machine independent graphics in the late 1970s. That was the first MATLAB. 1979, I visited Stanford on a sabbatical. I taught the graduate numerical analysis class. I used that MATLAB in the class. Half the students in the class were numerical and were math and computer science students. Uh, they were not impressed. This was not sophisticated mathematics. It was not uh, sophisticated computer science. Uh, today, they think they were impressed, as they recall at that class. But I, at the time, I think they were bored. The other half of the students were from engineering. They were doing things that I didn't know anything about at the time. Control theory, signal processing, systems theory, they loved MATLAB. They knew what these matrices were for. They were doing things that probably most of you people are using MATLAB for. But I didn't know about that. And so they found it useful. They'd been writing, they'd been doing computations by hand. They'd been doing, um, writing Fortran programs and they fell in love with MATLAB. They took MATLAB off to two companies that had spun off the Stanford Computer uh, Electrical Engineering Department, and these two companies uh, wrote uh, some commercial software for control design automation. This, these these uh, 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 software is called Matrix X and Control C, uh, and uh, that were available in the early 80s. Matrix X went on to become a competitor for MATLAB for a long time. Control C had just a short life because its principal engineer was Jack Little. Jack Little didn't take the course from me, but a friend of his did, and the, the friend introduced Little to MATLAB. Little 
loved MATLAB, threw away all his Fortran programs and immediately started using MATLAB. He came to me in 1984 and he said he wanted to make a commercial version of MATLAB. He went out, he went to Sears and bought this computer, uh, IBM compatible uh, uh, la uh, portable. Uh, he threw away all my Fortran and re-implemented everything in C. A colleague named Steve, he quit his job at System Control and um, went into the hills behind Stanford and spent a year and a half uh, rewriting it. Uh, introduced M files, introduced graphics. A colleague named Steve Bangert helped and the three of us founded MathWorks in California in 1984. And MATLAB had its commercial debut at a controls conference in Las Vegas uh, just before Christmas in 1984. Uh, MathWorks had started its, uh, MathWorks had two to the, had one employee, two to the zero employees in 1984. In 1985, Bangert joined the company, so it had two to the one employees. Here's a log plot of the size of MathWorks over its last uh, 32 years. We doubled every year for the first seven years. Um, we haven't kept that up. If we had, we'd now have two to the 32nd employees. Uh, and worse than that, we'd have to hire two to the 32nd more this year. But we now have pi times 10 to the third employees, a little over, over 3,000 employees. Here's the company when we, when we had two to the three employees. There's a little down in the lower right hand side. Here it is when we had two to the fifth employees, 1987, I joined the company full time. I didn't work for the company for its first five years. I'm one of the founders, but I'm employee number 32. Here I am in the left hand corner. Here's Jack in the upper right hand corner. Uh, this is in South Natick, Massachusetts. Uh, here, here we are a year ago when we had uh, our 30th anniversary, and this was in the San Diego Convention Center. It's incredible speaking to 3,000 people. We now have offices around, uh, 20 offices uh, around the world. Uh, we have a head, we have, how many, we have, how many offices here in Germany? Four? Four offices here in Germany including the office here in, here in Munich. Um, here's our campus in, uh, in Natick, uh, west of Boston. We just completed this building here. This was actually the, the um, architect's rendering before the building was built. This is an important slide that I uh, don't really have a whole lot of time to talk about. Um, this is what we do for a living. This is how we make our money. We, we're, we're not matrix laboratory anymore. We couldn't support 3,000 people on academic matrix computation. Uh, we do all these products, and you people know more about these things, much about these things than I do. I just saw, saw one of these things in operation a few minutes ago in your, your laboratory here. Uh, this is, this is a, a prime example of what we do, uh, control of, of uh, exotic vehicles. So you simulate the flight or the, the motion of these vehicles on your computer. You write software that controls the motion, the trajectory, you then download the um, software and into the, into the embedded processor on this vehicle and then drive it. So MATLAB or Simulink isn't running on the vehicle, but code generated by MATLAB or Simulink is. Uh, the, uh, the vehicle that just flew by Pluto a few weeks ago had code generated by Simulink in it. 
that was uh, was must have been generated. Where did, anyway, we were we were. It couldn't have been. Did it? Oh, so it was down. It, it, what, it wasn't in it when it left here, but it had been downloaded in the meantime because, yeah, right. I was thinking it couldn't have been downloaded when it left here. So anyway, um, so that we're very proud of that fact. The vehicles running around on Mars have, co have code generated. Um, and uh, I just saw, the, saw something today for the first time where I saw a... Uh, quadcopter with a Raspberry Pi riding on top of it that had uh, code generated by MATLAB. My wife was looking for a hearing aid for her mother, and she said, hey, Cleve, here's a MATLAB graphic. And I said, come on. And she said, no, this is it. So sure enough, there's about a dozen hearing aid companies in the world, and they all use MATLAB in the development of their hearing aids, not only for the signal processing involved, but also for the modeling of the ear. Uh, here is image processing to uh, recognize the license plate of a car in motion in the darkness in bad weather. Uh, challenging image processing problem. Uh, circuit boards and chips, laboratory equipment, uh, DNA, uh, financial uh, uh, modeling, financial instruments. These are all uh, businesses where MATLAB is playing an important role. Um, yeah, I have. To, I want to talk about this a little bit. Let me. I've got time to uh, do this. Talk about this. MATLAB and high-performance computing. Um, oh yeah, here, here, here's the thing. I, I just saw, I just saw your, your high-performance. Man, that, the Leibniz Center here, that was incredible. Seeing all the plumbing, that's going on there, and it reminded me of this. I was involved in. This machine, one of the world's first parallel computers, the Intel parallel computer made out of boards with Intel chips on it. And this was in, in 1986. And we had to demonstrate one of these things at a, at a conference in, in Knoxville. And we, it needed 220. And we didn't have 220 in the, in the, in the, hotel suite we were demonstrating so we rented a a generator and had it out in the parking lot with a cable running across the swimming pool and ran it to power the machine and at my talk somebody asked me a joke how many mega flops per gallon are you getting <laughs> and that was a joke but it's not anymore, right? I mean, this is the crucial question, right? How many megaflops per gallon are you getting over there in the Leibniz Center? That's really crucial. How many, what's, what's, uh, where's the power coming from? And, and how many, how many, uh, how many kilowatts are going into that beast over there? That's the crucial question. Um, Okay, but um, one of my most, but in the very beginning, uh, when, when, we, when, we, when I first started out in parallel computing, we were talking about distributing matrices. We were talking about taking a matrix, a matrix and distributing it across parallel, distributing it across multiple memories and doing Gaussian elimination or the QR algorithm on a matrix on multiple machines. And that's a losing proposition. No matter how fast your machine, how fast your arithmetic is and how fast your network is, the arithmetic is gonna be so fast that the network can't keep up with it and it's a losing idea to try and distribute it. The individual machines have gotten so fast today and the memories have gotten so fast, so big today, that you do your dense matrix computation on one machine, period. I mean, the, the, 
the Lindpack benchmark as a crazy idea, as a matrix computation, actually. Nobody wants to do those kind of things, really. So I wrote this article years ago called Why There Isn't a Parallel MATLAB. And this was my most frequently quoted article. For a long time, we didn't have a parallel MATLAB. But then, a few years ago, um, we returned to high-performance computing. Bill Gates actually gave a demo at a supercomputing conference in which he used MATLAB. And now it's a big deal for us. So we have the parallel computing toolbox and the distributed computing servers. How many people here are familiar with those? A couple of you. How many, somebody is, a couple of you are using them actually. Um, so MATLAB today, in many cases, you're getting parallel for free without even asking for it. So find grade and parallelism in which you use um, multiple cores uh, happens automatically in a, in a lot of cases. And many parts of MATLAB are parallel enabled without you even asking about it. Uh, but then if you want to do more coarse-grained parallel computing in which you go across um, multiple cores in a, in a multi-core machine or across multiple computers in a, in a distributed computer environment like the big machine over here. Then you want to get the parallel computing toolbox or the GPU array or the distributed computing toolbox. And then you have these constructs available to you. Um, par pool sets up a pool of multiple machines. And then par four is far and away the most important construct, a parallel for loop. These others like the par F eval and the SPMD are much more sophisticated, much less, much less frequently used. Um, we also have uh, tools for working with GPU arrays uh, that I, and I'm not going to have time to get into. I like to demonstrate this, and let me just go through this quickly to, um, without actually running it by showing you one example. The, I want to talk to you about my favorite financial instrument, blackjack. So blackjack is my stand-in for anything else that's going on in the world of finance. If you look at the graph of your pool in blackjack, it looks an awful lot like uh, the Dow Jones or IBM. Doesn't look like Volkswagen. <laughs> so I, years ago, I wrote a program to play blackjack. And, and blackjack is a nearly, if you play a good blackjack in which the player looks at the dealer's card and plays accordingly, it's, a nearly, it's nearly an even game. And so um, here are four players setting out to play. Each is going to play 10,000 hands of blackjack. Uh, and we're going to see how they do over, over those 10,000 hands. And here's how you, so that's this, pro, that's this program called Blackjack. Blackjack plays and hands a blackjack, and it doesn't know anything about being parallel. It was written before we had parallel MATLAB. And so this does par four around Blackjack. It sets up an array to collect the results, turns on the clock, kicks off par four, and runs four copies of blackjack, each of them to play 10,000 hands, and collects the results in B and plots the results. And here they are. Uh, blue does pretty well. Uh, purple loses. 
and the other two players come out about even. And so in this simulation, the four of them together actually came out ahead. Right? So that's simulating this financial instrument. We do four simulations, each of them independent of the others, and collect the results. Now here's what I want you to pay attention to. Where does the array B live? There are actually five MATLABs running here. The front end MATLAB, which sets everything else off, and four other MATLABs, each of which runs, run, runs one blackjack. And the array B, B belongs to all of them, right? Um, it belongs to the front end at the beginning. Then each of the four of them has access to it to put their results in it. And then the front end gets it at the end to plot the results. So there's actually communication between, the, between them uh, during this computation. If you're running on a cluster, MPI is going on underneath you without you knowing about it. And this is, there's some actually some pretty, and there's synchronization going on here to get the results going on. So there's a lot of sophisticated parallel, moderately sophisticated parallel computing going on here. Anyway, this is typical. This is how parallel MATLAB is being used almost all the time. PAR4 to set off parallel simulations, em what I called embarrassingly parallel. They're embarrassing because there's not much sophisticated uh, uh, parallel computing analysis going on here to, to, to think about this thing. Anyway, that's the parallel computing toolbox in action. Uh, okay, today, the dominant use of, of, parallel, uh, of parallel computing is the PAR4. Uh, distributed arrays have proved to be a, par a useful data structure but as far as we know, there's very little, I spent a lot of my time, a lot of my career worrying about how to do distributed dense linear algebra, but nobody, and we can do that, we can do that, but nobody's using it, because it's not, it's not worthwhile. Uh, so, MATLAB's historical and intellectual boss, basis is numerical linear algebra, that's, how I got started in this basis in this business, but its commercial success derives from applications in technical computing, the kind of things that I suspect most of you are involved in. But still, I like to quote Jim McClellan from Georgia Tech. The reason MATLAB is so good at signal processing or at many other applications is it wasn't designed for that specifically. It was designed to do mathematics. It's not just matrix laboratory anymore. It's gone far beyond that. Here's some websites you should know about. MATLAB Central is uh, for MATLAB groupies. Go there and any time of the day or night and you get your questions answered. Uh, participate in MATLAB contests. Um, here's here's uh, uh, my way. Here's the, my website where. Um, I have a couple of books that are available for free, textbooks involving MATLAB, and then I publish a blog and every two weeks. Um, well, it's been a little, I missed the last one, it wasn't quite two weeks, but almost every two weeks, Cleves Corner comes out with uh, reminiscence and mathematics and history and so on. Take a look at Cleves Corner. Anyway, thank you very much. We have time for a question or two, do we? Yes. Yeah. Oh. You say. Yeah, we'll have time for a few questions, but then we're also going to start off with the um, panel discussion. So have everyone start getting ready, and we can also move towards that section. So thank you. Any questions, feel free to ask.
Why is math worse than native? Because there wasn't any snow in Austria. So um, little, was, little was in California. And uh, he, and, he and his uh, fiance, Nancy, were going to go skiing in Austria. And they flew back to New England, where Little is from originally. But there wasn't any snow in Austria. So they canceled their flights to go to Austria and went looking at houses in the Boston area and uh, found a house they liked and bought it and moved back there. Now, that's not the version. I, I don't know if I should tell that story in public. but <laughs> No, Jack Little is from Boston area. His father was a professor at MIT. And he always wanted to move back there. He did. He went to school. Went to Stanford for graduate school and had a job there. But and we got started there. But he was. He was wasn't the place for him. And he always thought of going back to Massachusetts. And it's been great for us. Silicon Valley is a zoo, and people just move around jobs there. Divergence people equals zero is the theorem. They just change jobs. Um, the, the, you, I, w do you see the Silicon Valley? We have this sitcom in, in, in the U.S. about a parody about, you don't see that here. There's now a show on one of the cable networks in, in, in the U.S. about called Silicon Valley, about what it's like to have a startup in Silicon Valley. And it's pretty funny and pretty realistic. But we've been very fortunate to be in Silicon, in, in, in Massachusetts because we've been, because we've been able to hire really good people for all the other kind of jobs we have at MathWorks in addition to the technical people the personnel people and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and so uh, that's been great for us. And a lot of people come from around the world to go to school in Massachusetts, MIT, uh, Boston, Boston University, Northwestern, uh, Harvard, not so much. That doesn't count so much. But because uh, uh, that's not so technical. But, uh, and then they decide they want to stay there. So they come to work at MathWorks after they, after they go into school. We love, we love those people. We have a very international crowd working at MathWorks. We don't outsource, we insource. We bring people from around the world to work at MathWorks. Well, thank you for the answer. Yeah, long time. I went on and on. Oh, okay. I? No, I'm done, I'm done. Talk too much. Cliff, I, I have one question. Uh, on your list of all these fancy computer brands, uh, there was IBM, Amdahl, Boros, and all these um, supercomputers, uh, uh, DEC, Cray. Uh, uh, why was Prime not on that list? Oh, you mean the, the, the Prime? The, 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 uh, uh, the Linpack? Yes, mm, with, with this uh, mega flop list where, where for the prime, super fast I, prime. Well, that wasn't so much that wasn't so much a a big time scientific computer. That was a mini. That was a mini computer. By the way, we just bought the building that used to be the headquarters of Prime Computer. MathWorks now owns that building. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any further questions? Please raise a hand and I'll pass the microphone around. Over there. Anyone? That's a blast from the past, Prime Computer. <laughs> Anybody else here remember Prime Computer? There 
was a, 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 a prize-winning book called prize-winning book called the soul of the new machine about the people who built the prime computer a wonderful book Uh, you helped so many people to, uh, w with your work, you helped so many people to do engineering stuff and to do uh, scientific. What, what are the three uh, big questions that should en uh, engineering work and science solve uh, the next century? <laughs> three, big, three big questions that engineering and science should solve in the next century. I sort of joke, but, I, but I'm actually kind of serious about it. I'm, I'm not so much worried about pollution or global warming or so on as I am about, we're going to get, we're going to be, get, as I am about traffic. As I go around the world, we do a lot of traffic, traveling, my wife and I, in every place I go, in the world, the traffic is awful. Alexandria, Egypt, Goa, India, right? Traffic is awful. It's that that's I I, I just I don't know. Is it, it? It's a big problem on my personal list. Uh, the 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 kind of thing that's happened. I don't know. Can we do anything about the, the terrible thing that's happening with the refugees from Syria right now? Is that a, that's the, can science and engineering do anything about that? Can we can contribute anything to that? That's awful. We should pay attention to that. I have a question. Um, what are your thoughts on quantum computing? On quantum computing? Yeah. What are my thoughts on quantum computing? I'm really a skeptic. I, there's a whole lot of hype on quantum computing. Um, a, good, a, a, a good friend of mine, Diane O'Leary, a professor in, at the University of Maryland, has, who's done some work on quantum computing, she says quantum computing today is at the state of where digital computing was with Babbage. Right. So, so <laughs> you say what? That's optimistic. <laughs> Professor Broy contributes. It's it's in, it's there's it's entirely theoretical. I mean, there's there is some interesting theory and you know the mathematics around it. it it's it's. It spawns, I'm, I, I will argue as strongly as anybody about the value of, of pure research in, in mathematics and physics, and there's stuff going on in both mathematics and physics that has been motivated, it comes under the t title of prime computing, of, of, of uh, quantum computing. But the idea that they're going to actually make any computers in the near future is 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 way overhyped. What operating system are they going to run for God's sake? I mean, yeah. Um, there was a lot of talk about optical computing a bunch of years ago, and they started a company about that, uh, about that, and. They ended up making something that was a an attached array processor that could do a a Daxby. It could do a a, a, multi, a matrix vector product. If you shipped it to if you shipped it to vectors, it could it could take their dot product. That's all it could do. And it took forever to get them there, and you know. So, no, no way.
Well, thank you very much for both of you. Uh, over there, I see a hand over one there. One more, sir. one more. Oh, there, yeah, let's get the panel up here. Come on, guys. Um, I have a question. How do you see the scientific community evolving regarding computers? So when I just spec left and right, I see some people starting using Python or other open source things that are sort of accelerated through this massive uh, collaboration that's possible with Git or GitHub and all those fancy tools, building a strong community around that. How do you see that development and how do you see MathWorks within that development? Um, sure, people, people can use that stuff and, and whet their appetite and then when they're ready to do real computing, they can join the big guys. <laughs> um, so, I'm not sure. There's there's good there's interesting stuff going on there, and in in the in the area in the ac area the academic areas. I, I don't want I don't I shouldn't go on on this with a long on a long time. The, the, the open source community still doesn't, is, is a long way from having the kind of serious professional applications that we have uh, and that Simulink has uh, in, in the, kind of, the kind of stuff I saw here in, the, in your, your aer aeronautics lab today. We're a, long, we're a long way from that. Uh, it, I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't want to preach about it. Let me just. Uh, okay, very well. Yeah. Thank you very much for your questions and thank you for the answers. I think we're about to start the, 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 panel, the panel round now. So um, well, welcome the professors. Hey, thanks a lot.